This meeting yes. is being recorded. Okay. Let us begin after <laughs> our reciting of the birthday wish, uh, the Torah blessings before Torah study. And remember to mute yourselves if you're not speaking and make sure that we can see your videos, chat faces. Let us begin. Baruch Atah Blessed are you, our God, the world, the words of Torah. Amen. Amen. Hey, Rabbi. Okay, can everyone hear me and see me okay? Yes. We are on page 113. Huh. Baron. And they're doing a uh, ritual in the tabernacle, in the sanctuary area, in the ta tabernacle. And this go very wrong, and um, God executes them. And um, so the first question is, what were they doing and why? The second question is, why was that considered by God to be wrong? And the third question is, why the severe punishment? I mean, if we, so, so this is going to, uh, um, I've developed a, a differentiation between two words in English, ceremony and ritual. So let me, this is my own kind of theory. To me, ritual is something which is done in a very precise manner. And that means that ritual in, the, in this differentiation is something that God orders us to do in a very prescribed manner. And that if you do it in the prescribed manner, it could potentially be efficacious, effective. Meaning that God tells you to do something, you do it exactly as God tells you, and God may be happy and reward you for doing it. This is not something you do how you feel you want to do it or how you feel that your fellow people might understand best. Rather, this is something you do because God told you to do it. And God told you how to do it, those orders precisely. Um, if you want God to pretend. Rabbi, you're frozen and we cannot hear you. Can't hear you. And um, now there you are. All right. Um, now we hear you. We hear you now. Yeah, but it comes in and out. That's what um, I'm having problems too. All right. I need a second to regroup. I had to restart twice just now because of freezing. Rabbi, when's your birthday? Your email, it's I soon. I think I know what we have to get you. I just this is a brand new uh, a brand new computer. Well, it's, it's not Cox. your computer. It's Cox. Maybe you should have a conversation with Cox according to their bill. Twice. They said there's nothing wrong. They always say that. <laughs> they actually told me they had an outage in my area last week on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and they gave me $9 and change because I had a fight with them about it. My Wi-Fi keeps going in and out. Me too. And I think Steve is having problems occasionally too. I use Centrally. You too? I thought of something wrong with my iPad. Maybe it's Cox. No, it's probably Cox. 
I think the problem is because of the new cable they're putting in. No, it's not because of that. That's it's a whole new company. Heard. It's the whole new company. It's got shouldn't have anything to do with them. And it started before they did that. In Buckeye, we don't have these big city problems. <laughs> you have. Well, Cox is the only one wired for my neighborhood. Yeah, well, yeah, they're rewired. They're putting a new company, and I was just saying, uh, in this neighborhood in Sun City Grand. Yeah, there's, I don't know, the coaxial cable or whatever is, they're digging yeah. up everywhere here. Yeah, and we've got, there's road close, you know, like lane closures throughout the neighborhood, wherever they happen to be working. I, when I, well, I was out yesterday, I saw that the company itself has an office behind Walgreens off Bell, off Grand Avenue. And one day when I have time, I'm going to go in. It's called Zona Wired, W-Y-R-E-D, and see what their story is. If you have access to CenturyLink, they're amazing. Yeah, Sun City doesn't have such a relationship. We yeah, have access, but I've heard bad things about them too. They're good, oh, right. but I you can't get them here. Well, yeah, I I changed I changed over from Cox to CenturyLink because of the issues I would have with them. Yeah, but yeah. could you keep your Cox email address? You can keep everything the same. Well, how can you it's keep your Cox email if you have a different company? Yeah, how can you? Um, they everything was kept the same. Well, I didn't have a Cox email. Uh, I had, oh well, I that's the answer. Microsoft. Yeah, you had Gmail yeah, or they, something. Yeah, so everything was kept the same in my household personally, but it's just CenturyLink that the bill goes to now. I have to. I have a contract till October, and so I'm to, in October. I'm going to have to have the argument with them. You know, the whole hassle. Like I and threaten them, and then they bring it down. Where's the rabbi? There he is. He's just come back. He keeps disappearing. I got a Lorraine. Him. We're we're having technical difficulties with the rabbi's computer. So, in case you just come on, you understand now. Thank you. Hi, Lorraine. He's probably signing in on another device or something. He's been he's been talking on one device and and being visible on another. That's just what I do. I listen on my phone because it's I can hear it better, and I keep the Torah the pages on my iPad at the same time. Okay, can you hear and see me now? Yes. 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 Let me know. This is my old laptop. And uh, we'll see if this works better. Here, um, yeah. So could you, should I repeat what I would started with? I think yeah. I should. Oh, so um, uh, today we're talking about Nadav and Avihu. These are the two sons of Aaron. And they uh, engage in a ritual. And there's no indication that they intend to do anything wrong. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Yes. And uh, God is angry and has them executed or executes them. And so we have a series of questions. Number one is what, what, what were they doing exactly? Number two, why were they doing it? Number three, what was wrong with what they were doing? Number four, why did God punish them so severely? So um, I'm going to just give you a concept that I've developed in one of my books, uh, which is I differentiate between ritual and ceremony. Ritual is done exactly the way God tells you to do it. You don't have a choice. You don't deviate. You do it the way God told you because that's what you're supposed to do. And if you do it properly, it may potentially be efficacious meaning that it might actually help and God may reward you. If you do it wrong, God may punish you. That is ritual. In contrast to that, ceremony is the uh, modern idea that we do things, re religiously speaking, to find meaning, 
for ourselves. So you don't have to do it a particular way, even if the Torah or the Talmud or whatever text describes how you should do it. This is only a guide. So for example, our temple, or Louis, can't hear you can't hear me. You're breaking up. You're breaking up. Don again, off again. Yeah. My phone. Try the telephone connection. I think he is. He's frozen. We can't. Oh, there he goes. Okay, <laughs> I'm back a third time. Can you hear me? Yes. Hear and see. You can see, you can hear and see, good. Okay, um, did you hear what I said before? Oh, we heard the part uh, about ceremony and ritual. Now oh, mine okay. went in and out. Okay, great, great, great. So to give an example from our temple, and then you'll all no, everybody's um, please. I'm sorry. You can. This is terrible. It just comes in and it keeps going in and out. Bad connection today. Maybe we need to have an in-person class. It's cops. I'd love to join you in Arizona. <laughs> Where are you? Baltimore. Oh, okay. Baba, are you still with us? He looks like he's frozen. Yeah. On the phone too? Is he, is he using his computer at home or the temple? Uh, at home, but he's actually on his cell phone. Well, maybe it would help if he moved. Is the temple Wi-Fi any better? Mm, I I Got to try that. Is that better? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. I'm on my phone, so it's through the the AT and T rather than rather than the um, I'll 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 try this way and hope for the best. I apologize. It's not your fault. Um. So therefore, we have a ceremony. So to give an example from our temple, we do the Torah reading on Friday night instead of Saturday morning. The fact that halakhically. In the Talmud, it says you should read in the morning. We're not too concerned with that because we want people to hear the reading and we want to hear a certain amount that is useful and won't put them to sleep, but will inspire them. That's my definition of ceremony. But ritual can't be done that way. Okay, that's my opening statement. I'm sorry it was a little bit truncated. Um, do we have any uh, comments, brief comments or responses, um, Nan or Lorraine or Ellen? Hello. Pam has her hand up. Okay, Pam. I'm going to get you on another phone. Hold on. Okay. Um, so did Aaron's sons get a clear understanding <laughs> that this was... Ray? 
You want me to wait? <laughs> I think Ray needs to mute her her her. Uh, Say, size on it. No. Be muted now. Okay. Um. So did Aaron's sons get a clear un understanding that this was a, a big deal to change to change how they handled this ritual or ceremony? There's no indication they had any warning. They did what they, they I guess, thought that they should do. There's all sorts of suggestions of maybe what happened, but they're not in the text. So we just don't know. Um, Bernie. I think this is just another example of the interpreters trying to, to justify something that they really can't justify. Yeah, yeah. But you don't see any merit in this process of trying to justify things that can't be justified. Like, <laughs> I'd like to spin it in a positive way and say that the medieval sages are creative and trying to uh, explain away things in a good way. How is it a good way? Well, that's what I'm trying. I'm, that's what I'm hoping you'll be able to help me to do. I can't, I'm sorry. I think they just, it's a, it's a cop out. All right. Ray uh, has your hand up. Ray. Um, well, I, the first thing that I felt about this, can you hear me? Yes. Hear and see you, Ray. I, I had a very strong feeling that this was written. It says so in this script. It was written by the rabbis, not by, it was not part of uh, the temple um, uh, readings. Uh, and the rabbis uh, had this by uh, oral transition. And these were two young men who just stop and think of a uh, being a, the child of a movie star. When you go out, everybody puts you up on a, a little pedestal. Teenagers are a, a different kind of human being. Uh, they think that they have arrived at knowing about the world. These two young men in the story go into this, uh, holy of holies and light a pan for fire. If they were helpers, the only person who would go into that holy of holies was the high priest to light the fire. The only other person was Aaron. For if the story is true, they certainly should not have been going into the holy of holy on uh, on their own. So they were a couple of arrogant young teenagers. And uh, this story was all devised in the time of the rabbis. Uh, so I think the seriousness of it is greatly uh, reduced. Uh, but okay. they... Uh, the, sto uh, the story, the thing they're trying to teach us is arrogance. We cannot be arrogance, arrogant. And young teenage, uh, especially boys, I think, can be pretty arrogant. Oh, okay. Uh, especially boys. Uh-oh. <laughs> um, but, but um, this, Ray's pointing out a very serious problem that um, we could call this midot or musar, you know, that a Jewish approach to character traits is so important. And in this case, arrogance. And um, I mean, I run across this not only with, with uh, teenagers, but with adults and not only with adults, but people in our age bracket who somehow have gone through all of life in a very arrogant manner. I don't know how they've done that without getting fired and without having all sorts of problems, but apparently they have. 
and they're just like, um, I'm right. So midot is the word for character traits. And Musar is a 19th century movement in, that developed in, Jew, in the Jewish community in Lithuania, which was about focusing Judaism on character traits. So that Judaism wasn't only about you know, keeping kosher and keeping Shabbat and the ritual. And it wasn't only about the ethical laws like don't kill and don't murder and don't steal. But it was also about analyzing one's character traits in areas that aren't so clearly actionable. So it's, it, 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 in Ray's words, she said, being arrogant. So this is not acting arrogant in a particular situation where you're breaking a rule. It's more just an attitude. And, um, you know, on one hand, you don't want to be too humble, right? You don't want to be, you know, apologizing to everybody all the time for things that you shouldn't apologize for. You want to have self-respect and a certain sense of, of, uh, of, uh, you know, uh, looking at yourself as a good person and somebody valuable, but you don't want to go the other extreme. So it's a very delicate process of figuring out where you should be situated exactly on that spectrum. So Ray's comment, very useful here, how not to be arrogant. And these two young men apparently may have been arrogant. That's certainly an argument. Bernie, does that make the rabbinic justifications for what happened more justifiable if we're dealing with character traits? Yeah, maybe, but remember that all of this is imputed uh, hundreds of years later, or if not centuries later. I mean, if not more than that, millennia. Um, all of this stuff that's written in here, other than that they, they did what they did and they got killed for it, the rabbis, put their own spin on it and they weren't around at the time. I mean, the rabbinical period is what, 1, 1,500 years later than, uh, than, the, than this action? Um, potentially, yes, depending on how you count and depending on this, how old this exact piece of Bible is. So I, I'm, I'm not convinced. I, 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 I could be convinced that they, uh, they had good motivations that they were trying to serve God in their own way. Maybe they were the first reformed Jews. Uh, yeah. Um, all right. I, 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 I thought I agreed with Ray, but now that I'm here, Bernie talk, I kind of agree with Bernie. Um, so <laughs> I'm moving a little bit away from Ray's position, just a little bit here. Um, but Bernie's very persuasive. If anyone else want to jump into this, you can fight for Ray or for Bernie and, you know, give a good left hook and see, you know, uh-oh. The, the uh -oh. She's uh, ready. Ray, 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 um, Ray has just bought boxing gloves, so she's getting them out of the closet. Um, yeah. I've, got, I've got a point as well. Um, kind of an off spin of Ray's. What about affluency? Those boys thinking our father is Aaron, the one who is the most regarded. Our uncle is Moses. So we can do what we want. God's not going to punish us because we are who we are. Mm -hmm. um, yes, uh, th this, of course, goes back to that uh, court case in Texas several years ago where this teenager killed somebody driving too fast. And his lawyer argued in court that he shouldn't be punished because he had affluenza. He was raised so affluent that he couldn't tell the difference between right and wrong. And this is very interesting because it's exactly what Ray was talking about. That, you know, we're talking here about, um, about values. And, um, uh, and, and if, if Rochelle is right and Ray is right, that these two kids had a problem in their attitude, then, um, then that could be the lesson we're learning. 
Uh, Bernie says there's no evidence, however, that they displayed any sort of bad attitude. So we have that problem if we're looking at what's in the text. If we don't really care what's in the text and we're just trying to learn lessons about how to live one's life, then it's easier. We can say, don't be arrogant. Don't raise your children to be arrogant. And, you know, some people do this very successfully. Like we read about these very, very, very wealthy people who appear, at least from the magazines, to be successfully able to teach their children good values, not to take anything for granted, and to, 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 to have the obligation to work hard and to contribute to society and not just to, to buy a big yacht and go sunbathing in off the coast of Italy or wherever. And, um, and, 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 and then, of course, we read of rich people that seem to be the opposite. These uh, oligarchs from Russia, you know, I don't know what they do or don't do, but the way that they're portrayed, certainly with their $600 million boats, doesn't really um, make you very uh, comfortable that, that these people are utilizing their wealth in a way to, to benefit society. Um, Rochelle, did you want to respond back? Well, and, and, and I agree actually also with Bernie. I think there's a side of it that maybe they, they didn't, they didn't expect this would happen to them that they would, you know, like I said, their position puts them in a place where they can do these things. All right. Lorraine comments about spoiled children. Comments about what? Spoiled children or our uh, oh, arrogant no. children. Wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Marcia? Pam has her hand up. We're trying. Um, I was thinking that I think this was a lesson that the community had to learn that one doesn't mess around with the sanctuary rules. And it just mm -hmm. happened that these two kids, I don't know why we're saying they're teenagers, except for the fact that they weren't married because nobody was good enough for them. So that might make them a younger person, a really young person, because people got married at a very early age then. So, but I don't understand why you're all thinking they're teenagers. They just may have been arrogant men. And uh, one doesn't mess around with temple ritual at that point in history. You know, now we're a, a little bit looser in our times, you know, but um, and, and our approach. But uh, they couldn't let people just go willy nilly in there starting fires with the wrong kind of flames and the wrong kind of whatever. And so God was teaching them a lesson. Actually, a little further on, it says they actually got warned by God uh, and they were told to back off and they didn't. It wasn't just like, oh my God, they lit the fire and boom, that's it, dead. They were warned by God not to do this. And, uh, and I think at that point they were being punished because somebody had to be punished and they happened to be the ones that came along and did this uh, illegal act, okay? Okay. Um, our response, Ellen, Nan, Ellen. I, I, um, I was troubled by the, the severity of the punishment until I read that they were trying to take over and it's possible that they were, um, you know, they wanted to be in charge. So maybe it's like succession, you know, it's like this internal family war that's going on. We just don't know about it, but it just seemed like a very harsh punishment for burning incense. So if Putin's, uh, Putin's sons wanted to take over, would that be a bad thing? I mean, you know, sometimes the older generation needs to move to Sun City and take up golf and let the uh, let the younger generation run things, no? 
It depends. It's like everything. Okay, Bernie, what do you think that Ellen has a point there? No, I don't know because I, I think some of the comments here are confusing what what is purported to have happened and what the rabbis interpret later on. And they've developed this whole scenario about them plotting to take over from the old man and and et cetera, et cetera. And and I'm having a hard time reconciling with what's actually supposed to have happened. Now, Bernie is really, I think here, almost a Karite. So he is saying the Torah is what's important and what the rabbis say is not important. In, in the, the rabbinite culture, there's no difference. What the rabbis interpret the Torah to mean is what the Torah means. It's all one. And so there's a fluidity of interpretation that flows backwards. What the rabbis say about the Torah is what it is. Okay. Who um, appointed the rabbis to be the, the arbiters of, of yes. truth? Yes. And this is, a, this is exactly what the Karaites said in uh, the 8th, 9th, 10th century. They said Judaism is the Torah. The rabbis may be interesting interpreters and may not, but they have no authority. You can't just reinterpret a story like this out of whole cloth with no evidence from the text and just say, as Ellen says, that the um, that the um, you know that the, the these two young men or old men or whatever they were were trying to rebel against Aaron and Moses unless it's written in the text. And um, the rabbis would say that's our interpretation and our interpretation is not only valid, but is authoritative. And if Bernie was living in a rabbinical society, the rabbis would punish him. They'd say, you, you're a heretic. You're, you're not accepting the rabbinic interpretations, which is the authoritative interpretations. And we're going to send you on a boat and send you off to America or something like that. <laughs> you can't stay here in Poland with us because we, because you don't accept the whole validity of our interpretive tradition. Okay, who's first? Um, um, Steve, can you help me here? Pam um, was first and then, uh, let's see, B. We also have Cy and D, and I think there was another hand up too. There were a lot of, and Pam. And Rochelle. Okay, so Steve will give the order and you all speak one at a time. Pam first. Um, I think the rabbis came up with that thing about how it was really an insurrection and not a ritual thing, just to try to, because they realized the, the punishment was way over the crime. And I think it was a rabbinical way to explain why they, um, what, you know, capital punishment for doing this is ridiculous. So I think that's what happened. It's just the crime did not, the uh, punishment was overboard. Okay, so the punishment was overboard. They had to come up with a justification for it. But why do you think the punishment was overboard from a biblical point of view? Pam, what 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 was what was going on? But couldn't they just say, "You guys messed up. Never do that again." <laughs> well, but they didn't. God did. God said, "I'm going to kill them," and He just killed them. Why? I I can't come up with a good reason why they deserve they deserve that punishment. I mean, that that's that's the problem is that. There doesn't seem to be any explanation why they should have been executed. Mm -hmm. And as, as we've already said, they're not just anybody, they're two of Aaron's sons. Therefore, they're the hereditary line of the priesthood. So you don't want to just kill off your main priests. Yeah, I I I can't I can't I can't justify it. I just not seeing it. Okay, who's next, Steve? B. 
I think what bothers me the most about this story is it feels like it was pulled out of the air. There's no background for it. We don't know anything about these young men or old men, whoever they were. It just seems to be pulled out for a reason, maybe to for God's power or whatever, but there's no background. It's just mm-hmm. a story that seems to come out of the air. And I yeah. can't justify any of it. Yes, and we can't really explain it because we don't have enough context to do so. Okay, right. who's next? Guy. Well, I would like to think that there's a, a certain amount of progress has to be made. And if the rabbis who are reading <clears throat> the Torah and not making changes, uh, I think that's a, a terrible situation because uh, we would still be uh, in the status situation of uh, 3,000 years ago. And that's not what progress is about. If we all thought and did uh, what our ancestors uh, did, you know, where would we really be? I think that the people have to generate new ideas and have to perform on those ideas. Mm-hmm. Okay. Reva. Um, yeah, for me, I sort of enjoy this in a way. For me, it seems like the rabbis are spinning the information, the, the way we use it, the term politically nowadays. Also, on the right-hand side, right bottom side of page 113, we've got Rabbi Levy, and I don't know when this Levy lived, but um, he talks about arrogance as the motivation. And that uh, the two two young men bragged that no woman was good enough and that they're in, insensitive to take advantage of women fe- women's feelings, raising their expectations and hopes for a serious relationship with they had no intention of marriage. And so that reminded me of what we now call players. And in an earlier age, they were they were called either Don Juan or Don Giovanni. Or Casanova. Or Casanova will work. I have a friend whose cat is named Casanova. Um, <laughs> hey, right but, uh, um, he's creating a cat channel, so Casanova <laughs> may become a very famous cat soon. Um, the uh, and there's a new movie out called the uh, or new documentary on Netflix called uh, Tindler Swindler, about an Israeli from a poor family who claims that he's the son of of Lev Levian, who's a Russian-Israeli billionaire diamond merchant. And he goes dating these women, uh, most of whom are seem to be Scandinavian, and, you know, picking them up in his private jet and, you know, looking like he's a billionaire. And then he eventually says that somebody's trying to kill him and he can't use his credit cards and he gets them to spend all of their money, you know, to give him, and then he just disappeared. And he did this apparently, according to the documentary, uh, a, a number of times. And, um, you know, and now he's back in Israel and he spent very little time in prison. And um, it's, uh, it, if it's true, it's just really, really unbelievable. Okay, Steve, you can pick the next person. Ray. Is that me? Yeah. 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 Well, according to what I have always heard about the Stato, is that the, the, the um, young men who were good scholars and the old men would sit in the synagogue and discuss every line of the uh, Torah and try to interpret it. And they would call it pirpur, you know, being, uh, uh, every word is very important and there's a reason behind it. And they interpret all the time. And the other uh, thing that you would hear is that if there were three Jews on a deserted island, there would be three synagogues. So Mm -hmm. you're going to get three different kinds of Judaism. Um, Uh 
The I, version I, I heard of this is there's one Jew in two synagogues. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, um, and another thing is there is there are some terrible uh, punishments. Uh, 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 Jacob almost got killed by his father. Samson just pulls down some pillars and bango, he's gone. These are all very dramatic uh, endings of uh, 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 stories. Um, and there's a, 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 there is a different interpretation by our rabbis about Aiz, uh, uh, Isaac and his son. And um, uh, I remember in astonishment being in a Torah class some years ago and learning that uh, the modern thought is that Samson never lived. So, but that story is one, um, that says don't marry out of your faith, which has a lot of validity. So where do I stand with four non-Jewish daughters-in-laws? I wouldn't change one of them. They make my family happy. And I wouldn't force them to convert because you have to want to convert. And then you really make it. So, yes, it's, it changes. It changes. Um, thank you, Ray. Um, Bernie, does Ray's argument here hold any water? The idea that this type of intense reinterpretation process is an intellectual exercise and that by taking a story like this and coming up with all sorts of creative reinterpretations that are not in the text and are not even hinted at the text, that this is part of the secret of Jewish intellectuality, which contributed so much not only to making Judaism an uh, interesting religion, but to contributing all sorts of knowledge to the world in science and so forth. My head is starting to explode. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do have to remember that the, the time frame in which this was supposedly happening, and, and I'm sure that there was human sacrifice among the other uh, people nearby. So it's, it's not a, a stretch to, to offer something like that in our story as well. Okay. Um, um, B, uh, comment about any of this. Um, uh, is there one interpretation of the reason why these two sons were killed by God so abruptly and definitively that that you like that if that helps you to 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 understand this story, or do you agree with Bernie that it's just all made up and that there's no reason here. Well, I don't know if it's all made up, but I feel like they just took a story and plunked it into the Torah without background, without anything. So it does seem as if somebody just made it up because there is no background. Mm -hmm. How did this occur? Why did the story put in? There are a lot of questions, but no answers. What about the theory of arrogance? If, 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 uh, if these two gentlemen were arrogant and aloof and abrupt, would that justify it? It would not justify killing them. No. Nothing, I don't think it justifies capital punishment. I think it deserves more than a slap on the wrist but it doesn't deserve capital punishment. So I can't believe that God would do that just for this. I thought we had a loving God and I think there had to be more reason than just their arrogance and it's not explained. Okay, well, that's pretty clear. What, Rochelle, back to you. Um, I just like to say, I think that this story is one that keeps me in line. <laughs> Whether <laughs> Whether, whether it is something that is proverbial, 
um, or whether it is an actual act, uh, excuse me, an actual, you know, event, it keeps me in line. It, uh, it makes me know that yes, we do have a loving God, but we also have a God that at any given time can open the ground and swallow me up. So I okay. think about my actions very often. Um, uh, Babette, would you agree with Rochelle that the idea that we, that there's a God up there who's not only all powerful, but perhaps capricious and could punish you for something that might be seen as minor, like taking an extra half percent on a commission or something when no one's looking, <laughs> that, that you could just get struck down unilaterally and suddenly? Is that something you can deal with? Well, I, I, I don't think that there's a cruel God first of all. And uh, you know about the punishment um, fitting the crime, so to speak. I, I think that the punishment was very severe and it, it's hard to say that if you don't obey my commandments, you're not gonna be on the planet, you know? I, I so, think there could be other other ramifications. You, you know, uh, it, it, it's beyond, um, I, I think we as, as Jews feel, you don't get the death penalty. So you don't uh, like this idea of God being a God that might strike people down for minor, minor infractions? Well, we, I've said it before, what goes around comes around. You know, if you're disobeying, you don't get a punishment for, for death unless you, you know, perhaps are committing death. You are committing murder, you know, like that. And, and remember also that what was a crime in those days, some of those are not crimes today, right? So... Um, it would be terrible for God to kill somebody and, and for something that today is considered fine. You know, that would really be bad. You know, at least if you murder somebody then or murder somebody now, that's a bad thing and it's a punishable offense. But what if you are punished for something that's no longer a crime now? That would really be the pits. Sai, did you want to talk? And then if Steve wants to say something after that. Well, I, can... I don't find it difficult at all to accept the fact that God would do what he did only in that point of time. Now, the same situation uh, today, of course, is different. If you think back on the history, not so long ago, uh, people accepted slavery. Uh, some groups uh, kill their children uh, uh, to, uh, to assuage God. Uh, but the situation is different today. And so what was good then, obviously, obviously is not a good thing today. And we would certainly object to it. And there's nothing wrong. And that's the way things should move. We keep progressing. We keep getting new ideas. And, and, and maybe 200 years from now, We'll be back to the acceptance of God uh, killing some people again. Who knows? But today, we won't. Now, what about, Sai not killing people, but if God were to punish them in other ways, like the book well, of Job, who, who kills the uh, Job's family? But at this time, God do, punishing anybody is all wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. Steve, any uh, comments? D and then uh, Ray. Okay. Well, what bothers me is with saying that ideas have changed, societies have changed. Are we saying that God has changed? Absolutely. Is God God? Absolutely. God oh, has wow. changed? More wow. than the rest of us. <laughs> well, so yes. So B, yes, Sai is saying that God has matured and that God grows and responds to 
uh, people and society. It's a view. You don't agree with it? Go tell us. Well, I don't know. I think God is God. And I don't know if God is a spirit that changes or a spirit that's absolute. I can't, I don't understand that. Mm -hmm. So for you, God is a universal construct and yeah. God is eternal and mm -hmm. all powerful, all knowing. And by definition, God is the ultimate. And so God is not like a, a, a human teenager that we expect to mature or a dog that you're going to train. God is God. And the idea that God can uh, change either positively or negatively is, is heretical. So we're, we've already established, I think, that Bernie is a heretic. And now B is suggesting that Sai is a heretic. Oh, I have a long time. Oh, there you go. Okay. B, you're, you're, you're in a study, a Torah study group with some really serious heretics. Okay, Steve, if you want to t uh, say a comment, you can. Otherwise, tell us who's next. Well, uh, D. Sams is next. And then Bernie and Ray. Bernie, Bernie and then Ray. <laughs> and then I think we should start reading the, uh, the, the, uh, the text. Okay. <laughs> We have a request to read about Rabbi Hirsch on page 115 also. Yes. So, I was. So I can wait if you want to read and then. No, no, we'll, we'll take these three comments. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> um, I look at um, God as nature, everything. And I can't wrap my head around this crime I think in my world, the way I see it, and the point that they were trying to make is with this arrogance of these two young men, um, it's more like a spiritual death rather than killing them like that because that is just so extreme that I don't think anybody here can wrap their head around that because they really didn't do anything to warrant some sort of uh, death like that. But in the way I read it, it was more like a, to set an example of spiritual death, because the Torah is where all our, our laws are, and we're supposed to obey the laws. So um, I think that, um, I don't think Bernie is a heretic. I think he has a good point, and I think B has a good point. I think Bernie's proud of being a heretic. <laughs> Okay, uh, Bernie's next, and then Ray. You know, we've been talking a little bit about whether God is, has changed over time. I can think of three Bible stories where God is very inconsistent. Um, Sodom and Gomorrah, where he just, after, after we couldn't find 10 righteous people, killed two cities, and then drowned the whole world in the story of Noah. But in the case of Adam and Eve, when they... Uh, ate from the forbidden fruit they were just kicked out of the garden and nothing more happened to them so yeah considering that these stories are probably written by different people is why we think that god is inconsistent okay not everybody here thinks god is inconsistent but certainly some do and mm -hmm. uh okay bye minya and uh good luck um okay um back to you ray well uh in my readings of the, uh, how religion began i took a course of in it um when i was uh, in my teens just in, in early college uh it started with fear and awe over um lightning thunder heavy rains, all the all these things that affected um, er, earlier man. Uh, so I think maybe the religions through the, uh, their development all had a um, an element of fear of what would happen if you did not stick to the rules. And maybe that's part of these far out stories just 
to make us have some fear and awe and oh i can't do that it's uh, in the bible i can't do that okay but, fear yeah so you if it, it, it's uh, in hebrew the word is yira and it's one of the basic ways that you uh keep people in line through religion you know the southern baptists who say if you don't do what i the the priest uh, the minister says you don't do what i tell you you're going to burn in hell for all eternity so it's a, a way to inspire fear and, and 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 certainly you needed it because look at how the israelites were behaving at the giving of the torah at mount sinai they're building a golden calf so if you can frighten them into doing the right thing maybe that's necessary all right let's let's look um i think reva's suggesting that we start we're not going to obviously read the whole thing we had a a little bit of a delayed start because of my tech problems and then we've had a very interesting opening discussion so let's go toward the end it, and it was, on, i'm sorry it was pam who brought it up okay pam so let us look at page 115 and I, uh, but instead of starting with samson raphael hirsch the founder of neo neo orthodoxy in 19th century germany i'd just like to start at the top of the page with naftali hertz wesley now wesley is a early maskil a maskil is a german jewish enlightenment thinker um, but it's at the very beginning of the enlightenment so he's going to be a little bit careful what he says but he's going to try to be enlightened but very gently so who'd like to read page 115 in his reflections on nadav and avihu he wants to read okay good thank in you Pete. in his reflections on nadav and avihu natali hurt Wesley is much less critical than other commentators. Wesley calls Nadab and Abdihu religious personalities of the highest order who did not act out of selfish ambition or any other mean purpose. Quite the opposite, he says Wesley, says Wesley, the two sons of Aaron were deeply moved by the beauty and the meaning of the ritual sacrifices offered by Moses and Aaron. In their enthusiasm and joy, they lost their heads and entered the Holy of Holies to burn incense, something that they had not been commanded to do by Moses. Their wrongdoing, Wesley argues, was not the deliberate breaking of the law, but rather their failure to control their religious enthusiasm. They should not have gone beyond what Moses had commanded. They should have been more humble instead of blindly assuming that whatever they did in the sanctuary would be acceptable. They were punished, says Wesley, because they occupied positions of importance, which they misused in their misguided excitement and zeal. Okay, so, and this is a commentary on Moses' Mendelssohn's uh, translation of the Torah into German, and this is this this is the the period in which Jews are first really settling into Germany uh, in terms of integrating into the society, and the they're they're learning German through their study of Torah, and Mendelssohn who was an Orthodox Jew was in favor of orthodoxy but he wanted jews to become part of german society you know and but it, it it didn't really work out the way he wanted to all of his grandchildren were christians and um and mendelssohn if anything is seen as the 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 intellectual forefather of reform judaism if anything um anyway wes wesley says that their sin was to be too enthusiastic is it possible to be too enthusiastic nan 
And he, you, you, you know, if we in our temple on a Friday night got really enthusiastic and people start dancing and jumping around and throwing wine glasses during the service in a good way, is that a problem? Not on Purim. <laughs> All right, what if they stomp up and down so hard because they're so enthusiastic you can't hear the prayers? Is that a problem? I mean, Marsha, any comments about, can you be too enthusiastic? I don't think that your example is quite fitting for this. Okay. This, this was approaching into the sanctuary and over the last few years, the over and over they've been told, do not go into the sanctuary unless you're wearing the right clothes and you're carrying the right stuff and on and on and on. And then these two, guys say hey our fathers are getting old we're going to try practicing messing around in there i think it was a very strong um punishment but i think at, as everybody not and many of us have said today you've got to consider the times and things were different then and so i'm not going to be too hurtful i mean those guys Weren't there two different other tribes that wanted to take over and they got sucked up into the earth and killed? Yes, uh, the, 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 the rebellion of Korach. Yes. And I have a friend in Israel who did his PhD dissertation, like 400 or 500 pages on that story. And um, so that was a similar you know, ambition to take over uh, Moses and Aaron's position at that right. point, and they got sucked up. But because these two happened to be the sons of Aaron, they their treatment really shouldn't be any different, you know? So I don't know. Okay, B, thank you. Thank you, Marsha. Well, my I'm starting, my thinking is starting to change. Because if God was the same in modern times, Reformed Jewry would not be acceptable to God because everything has changed. But we're here and we're alive to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. So maybe God has, maybe God changes with society. Mm -hmm. Don't know, I'm confused. <laughs> we all are confused well isn't isn't god a reflection of the society well that that's a that's hmm. a subjective comment maybe bernie would bernie might agree with that but uh reva might not uh reva yeah i i read this as fables or mythology which has deeper meanings but not literal not literally and when we're interpreting why somebody why these two gentlemen did whatever they did we're just mind reading you know we're just taking guesses with some fairly thin material so you're supporting bernie here and saying that we're really um not only on thin ice we're on no ice at all and you can't interpret things unless you have evidence on which to base it on i i see it as theater you know or literature rather than literal truth but but i yeah. think you know i think those things often have deeper meanings that are important so i think the messages are important but you can't take it a lot of it literally and it sort okay. of changes over time with with who who's doing the interpretation because they do it within the context of their period of time and their culture all right, so you you are more so you're more sympathetic to what the rabbis are trying to do, provided that we understand that it's symbolic or, or right. it, these are metaphors. These are not we're not historians trying to determine what actually happened, which is possible by Nan. And um, uh, okay, so that, in that way you differ from Bernie in that you do believe it has tremendous meaning. All right, back to Pam. If you want to read the part it's beginning at the bottom of page 115 um, that deals with Samson Raphael Hirsch. Good. I'm glad we're reading this part because I think it's very interesting. Uh, Rabbi Samson Hirsch criticizes Nadab and Abihu for similar reasons. 
He explains that Judaism is a tradition of laws and commandments given to bond the community together as a sacred people. When individuals act out on their own zeal to change or break the law, they end up disrupting community expectations and unity. The Dom and Behut have may have been dedicated priests, as Wesley argues, but they're endangered community disciples and trust with their new and alien fire. Hirsch goes on to identify the, their actions with modern reform and conservative rabbis who make changes in Jewish tradition. He comes- uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> Nothing personal. Uh, it we- is personal. We can understand that the death of priestly youth is the most solemn warning for all future priest rabbis against every expression of caprice and every <coughs> idea of what is right and becoming, not by fresh inventions, even of God-serving novices, but by carrying out which is ordained by God has the Jewish priest rabbi to establish the authenticity of his activities. Disturbed by the rising tide of reform leaders, who called for more flexibility in interpreting the meaning of Torah and Jewish law and for changes in the law to make more relevant to modern Jewish experience. Hirsch condemns reformers for bringing alien fire into the sanctuary. He identifies them as the Nadav and Behus of their time. Um, this may be why the Chabad rabbi in Glendale refused to um, to send me a little email welcoming me to the West Valley. And uh, when I complained and somebody brought my message to him, his response was, he's the senior rabbi, and therefore I should have greeted him, not the other way around. Uh, uh, Which obviously is not true because if you're new, if you move into a new house, it's the neighbors who've been living there that greet you, not the other way around. But obviously, he views me as this this terrible person bringing alien fire, and he shouldn't greet me if it was the biblical times. He would have me executed. So we haven't become friends. <laughs> 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 okay, Pam. Uh, Pam, keep reading, and then I see some hands. I love that thing about alien fire. I'm going to remember that line. Uh, Reform and conservative Jewish leaders would defend themselves by pointing out that the Jewish law has never been static, inflexible, or resistant to change. In every generation, Jews have sought to shape laws of Torah to meet contemporary needs. Jewish practice is dynamic, always evolving, to meet new circumstances and situations. Instead of being the Dom and Behus reformers, reviewed themselves as carrying on the Torah traditions of Akiba, Hillel, Maimonides, and Rashi by reverently reinterpreting and expanding the meanings and relevance of Torah. Having surveyed a variety of observations, we are left to decide why Nadab and Behus were punished. Was it ruthless ambition, uh, arrogance, insensitivity? or the failure to consult others and honor elders? Was it youthful zeal, blind faith, the failure to realize the dangers in changing rituals and practices of a community? As we have seen, Jewish commentators see in this sad tale significant ethical and social lessons that continue to challenge Torah interpreters today. All right, Pam, so what did you make of this section of Samson Rayfield Hirsch? Well, I am, I'm no longer a Hirsch fan. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think he's, you know, he's stuck in that orthodoxy uh, situation that frankly just, you know, well, there's a reason I'm reformed. But anyway, um, (laughs) I just, I, I, you know, I think we all agree things evolve and well, he doesn't, but we do. (laughs) So. Can you understand why he would think the way he thinks? Well, he's resistant to any change. And I think that's not, you know, that's not realistic in religion. Um, hmm. Okay. Um, so religions have to change over the course of time. 
So, um, okay, let me just give yeah. you an example on our class. Yeah. We talk about homosexuality, right? And how religion has a has a related to that, and we've agreed that it hit. You know, people's feelings in the religious world has evolved on that subject. For our minds, but not in Iran. In Iran, they execute gay people. Um, so yeah. I guess it depends where, but I, I agree with you, Pam, 100% that religion has to change with the times if it's going to stay relevant and meaningful. Rochelle. I think this brings up a great point that, you know, I wonder sometimes about Orthodox. Are they, are they in the Orthodoxy because this is their honest beliefs or are they there out of fear? Out of fear of what God would do to them. Most of the people that I know in Orthodoxy are there because they like the lifestyle. So they, they enjoy not driving on Shabbat and they enjoy being in a community where everybody comes to synagogue every week. They wouldn't want to be in a reform place where we have to be basically pulling people's teeth to get them to show up. And, you know, it's, it's hard when everything's optional and everything has to, is, is based on what is meaningful. It's hard to keep people motivated and particularly... And, and less motivated people become even less motivated so they enjoy it and they like but if you ask them do you believe in in the beliefs of orthodoxy i don't think they'll want to say no i think it's completely bogus they'll they'll say well i see it in a more you know metaphorical way or the, they'll they'll explain it away kind of in a uh, yeah, sorry, Rochelle, back to you. Well, I think it just goes like, um, as Pam was saying, and, you know, as, as everybody, Bernie has been saying, everything evolves. God created man physically to evolve. We have evolved. Everything in this world evolves. And not everything is for everybody. So God, in my opinion, we evolve with God or God evolves with us. And we, I think we kind of make that choice. And, you know, you can see people's lives whom either they don't have a God or they believe in God and they don't take the signs from God that their life goes awar. But you see happy people. They and God have got their thing going on. I've got my thing going on with God. What I do isn't the same as everybody else, but it works for me. It's my personal thing. And okay. I think that when religion takes and encompasses and there's all this forcing of all these minds to do the same thing all the time, I think that would anger God because you're not worshiping your, to your potential. You're worshiping to the potential somebody else tells you to worship to. Does that make sense? Yeah. To me, it makes sense. But to an Orthodox Jew, it would not. <laughs> so I guess it's all a matter of um, who you are and what your attitudes are, right? Uh, other comments? Um, thank you, Rochelle. Uh, Ellen or Lorraine? D. Sams has had her hand up. Okay. D. Um, well, I was going to um, speak about the Orthodox when you were talking, Rabbi, and um, my sister was married to an Orthodox man, and in no way did he feel that he had to do any of what he did. He did it because it was in his heart to do it. He had the desire to do it. So um, I think that... Um, these people, I work for a very orthodox dentist in Chicago. He was very happy uh, every day of his life because he felt what he was doing was the right thing. It doesn't mean it's right for us as reformed Jews, but I don't look at it as 
them being forced to do it um, and that God's going to be angry because they don't do it. I think they do it because it's their desire to do it and their choice is to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. He has your hand up. Be hit. And Alan. Oh. So can I speak then? Go ahead. Um, okay. What Rochelle said was very poignant to me because we're talking about whether God evolves with us or we evolve with God. Can you clarify that, Rabbi? Does God evolve with how we are evolving, or do we evolve because God is evolving? I'm I'm confused. Uh, ha, ha. Um, I mean, we've done a series of courses a few years ago about God and this idea. Um, so, at the end of our session today, I don't think I can give you a definitive answer on that, but there is a view. There's many views of, 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 of approaching theology or God. And that's one of the ways that we need to ex, you know, explain Judaism because for many people, God is the God of the book of Exodus who has all powerful and, and does miracles mm -hmm. and, and, and punishes people um fairly uh, capriciously like in the book of leviticus here although as a number of people pointed out it wasn't capricious in that they were warned repeatedly everybody was warned re repeatedly stick to the rules especially in the sanctuary and they may not have but nevertheless this kind of god is not something that many of us believe can believe in or want to believe in or feel that the values that we hold is consistent with. Once you see that there's numerous approaches to God, you know, uh, that range in all sorts of ways, then it opens up a lot more religious possibilities to people. In terms of your specific question, um, there is a view that God, just like we grow, God grows. And this is a relationship, like Martin, uh, Martin Buber said, I thou relationship. So it's not a one way thing that God. Now, of course, there is the standard theological view, and this goes back to what B and I were talking about that God is perfect and, and eternal. And there's Maimonides' view is that God is way above us. But there's another view uh, or other views that God is really not way above us, that God is like us in some ways, you know, but Selim Elohim, just like it says in the book of Genesis, we are created in the image of God. And for this kind of interpreter, that means that just like we have emotions and we have, we make mistakes and we try to improve, so too does God. And so as we uh, grow and hopefully mature, God grows and matures in sync with us. And so, and we in sync with God. So it's a relationship like a marriage. And this is, this analogy is used in the, in the Torah and the Tanakh, the book of uh, the Song of Songs and so forth. Hi, okay. Can I pull you back? But this is something that, you know, could be, you know, talked about for hours and hours and hours, weeks and weeks. Ellen and then Rochelle. I don't see this uh, section as being about a relationship. I think this is more about us trying about when it was written, un, uh, people understanding that God wants what God wants. And, you know, good luck to you if you don't do that. So it's a control, it's a control thing. Okay. Um, but but the I guess the question that B was asking was in more general terms, um, could we see God in in, a, in in the sense that she was describing? And um, and I, I said yes. The, does is that w uh, approach to a relation with God, you know, manifested in this story? Yeah, I agree with Ellen. No, but but. You know, I, I'm not that concerned with this story. I'm concerned with my overall 
relationship with God, which is important to me. Okay, um, who, Rochelle, I think was next. Um, and I just want to say that you know I'm I, I maybe maybe it sounded wrong. I don't want to say that there's that I I want God to evolve with me. I am extremely afraid of God. I guess, but what is right for me may not be right for other people. I feel that God governs us as individuals. And, and that's the whole reason that the reform movement went away from 10 different services reflecting 10 different approaches to God to a, a prayer book where it's one service and each prayer is a little bit different because we are felt that we can never please you know, you can't have a service with one theology. And when you've got a congregation, if you have 50 people there representing eight different approaches to God and another few people that don't have any idea what their approach to God is, any approach you pick is going to alienate more people than it's going to satisfy. So you mix them up in one service and you hope for the best. The, the weakness in that is that Reform Judaism really presents its theology through the prayer book. And if you read the prayer book, it's not consistent. And so it's not consistent because we're not, we may not even be consistent within each other, within one person. So the way Dee feels about God may not be the way she felt about God three or four or six months ago. But certainly if you take a group of five or 10 of us, you know, we're all over the place religiously. And, and even though we practice the same and we like this, may like the same songs and hopefully we all like the rabbi, it's still we have all sorts of different views about what God is. And some of those are stated and some of those are not. Um, other comments? R Riva. Yeah, two comments. One, when we started off, you talked about ceremony and ritual. And I was thinking in the context of ceremony that the temple offers us rich opportunities to do just what you described, do things religiously to find meaning in our lives. And so I think in that way that the temple is, supports us a lot. And then I was thinking in terms of Orthodox Judaism, and I, I have a family of Orthodox Jewish children and grandchildren, what I see that they have that I find beautiful that I would like to include in my life is they have a strong sense of community, a really powerful sense of community. And I think that is beautiful. And I think that's one of the reasons some people stay orthodox because their community is enormously important and enriching to them. Yeah, and, and it's a much more intense community than anything we can create. Right, but, but I think if we increase our sense of community, that's a good thing. Yes. Um, but when you don't drive and you live near each other and you keep kosher, it, it, it promotes much greater dependency on one another, which is good. Um, and, um, and maybe it's not always so good. I think we have to find in our own lives where the balance is for each of us individually. Okay, we have time for maybe one more uh, comment and then over to Steve. Hey, go ahead. See, as I see God in my life, I think of ways that I could be closer to God. And to me, it's good works. I climb, I'm always climbing the mountain to get closer to God. That's what motivates me is feeling that good works and caring for other people is what brings us closer to God, caring for our fellow man. That's just a personal belief. Mm, very nice. Okay, thank you, B. Back to you, Steve. Okay, Reva, do you have some uh, announcements that you would like to make? No announcements today. Okay. Then let us conclude with the final blessing. Baruch Atah
Blessed is our God, God, our God, ruler of the universe, the universe who has given us, given us a truth to teach it. And planting in us eternal life. Blessed is Adam, the giver of the Torah. Amen. Have a good rest of the week, everyone, and uh, be safe. You too. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Again, happy birthday, Ray. Happy birthday, Ray. Happy birthday, Ray. Hey, Ray. Happy birthday, Ray. <laughs>